Would you like, would you like the microphone, Michael? Uh, it's just another prop, so I'm yeah, gonna... you know, yeah, we can't do it. Good thing I didn't have it when I said that. <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this meeting. Um, I've been asked to go over a brief history of the course of the Taylor Charles Regatta. And let me just say that the course committee is actually composed of four co-chairs, three of whom are present this evening. I'm only one of those four. Um, the other is Chris Richards, whose who's stalwart volunteers paint this entire collection of buoys every Columbus Day weekend before the regatta. And there's also um, uh, Tim Wood, who sets half of the course. And then there's our attorney friend, um, whose name I just can't remember. <laughs> Tim, uh, is it, um, come on, help me here. Who is it? John, Joe, no, no, he's right in the back there. Michael. Yeah, Rick Sampson, sorry. Rick Sampson, who was responsible for the finish line area, all the ways to separate the lanes at the finish line. Um, all right. Well, where do we begin? 1964. Show of hands, how many were here then? I don't see many hands other than mine. All right, that's when this whole thing started 50 years ago. It was quite an event. The course at that time consisted of some of these <laughs> Clorox bottles. And as I understand it, uh, they sent around notice to club members to start hoarding their Clorox bottles uh, in the winter time, so that by the time they got all the way around to the next year, they would have enough Clorox bottles, uh, several hundred of them, no doubt, to set the course. And you also needed, likewise, several hundred of these. And a case of this. And the way they set the course is they load up a launch with bricks, empty Clorox bottles, string, and off to BU they went. And they'd get to where they thought they wanted to set a buoy, and they'd tie the string onto the bricks, kind of hard to do with one hand, and then they would lower the brick over the side to see how deep it was, and then they would take the other end of the string and cut it and tie it onto the Clorox bottle. And all of this time they're at the mercy of the wind and the current. And so it went all the way up the Charles. I rather suspect it took them all day. I, I don't know because I wasn't here then, but that's my guess. And so it went for 15 years. And then along came this guy named Sherry Proctor, a 54-year-old architect um, who lived in Manchester, Mass. And a little, little aside here, I, you gotta love this story about Sherry. He learned to scull at Weld Boathouse. They had a summer rowing program back then. So he went down and he learned how to scull. And after the classes were over, he just kept going down to the boathouse and taking out a single. And he kept rowing and he kept did, did that for, for a long time before somebody finally said, um, are you a professor at Harvard? Do you? And so, he was out. But in the meantime, he made a lot of friends at Cambridge. And he joined the Cambridge Boat Club. And he came down here and, and began to row competitively. And he wanted to participate. He wanted to volunteer. So he got on the course committee. And one session with these. And he thought to himself, there has to be a better way to do this. There has to be a better way. So that was in 1979 he entered the scene. And his first challenge was to design a buoy that would meet the qualifications of racing on the Charles. And this is what he came up with. Picture this, if you will, a white length of this polyethylene foam, six inches in diameter and about three feet long. And you run it through a bandsaw, and you get three-inch height discs. OK. These were perfect, because they had just the visual profile that he needed. They were kind of soft and spongy, so if you hit it with the ore blade on the recovery, you wouldn't capsize your single. And if you inserted a few wooden pegs in the bottom, you could wind the tether and stow it neatly. And it was small enough so that a volunteer with a, with a small hand could reach into the Charles and pluck it out at the end of the day without any effort at all. And they simply had to haul aboard the anchor. Okay, so we've solved the problem of the buoy. Now the next thing he had to do was figure how big an anchor do I have to have so that this won't, be, won't carry it away if the tether's too short and hold it in one place and be the kind of anchor that we can get out of the soft muck at the bed of the Charles. So there was a couple of iterations. This is one of them. You'll see them kicking around the boathouse. They use these other iterations for doorstops now. <laughs> what they finally settled on was this. This is about five pounds. It's um, schedule 40 PVC of just the right diameter and just the right height so that 
you can get 14 of them nested carefully in this crate, which was ingenious in itself because the separator gives a space for the volunteer's hand to go in so you can grab a hold of the crate without skinning your knuckles. I swear, the man thought of everything. He made these buoys so that they were just the right height so that when they set in the crate, you could nest another crate on top of them and they wouldn't slip and fall and slide off. The other interesting thing is this clip of which I think he ordered 5,000 of these things. We still have bags of these around here. If you look carefully at this plastic clip, you'll see that it doesn't close all the way. So your bail on your anchor has to be large enough so that when it's clipped, it won't pop out if it's, if it's not under tension. And he thought of that as well. So some of the early anchors have smaller bales. The later ones now we use um, stainless steel U-bolts that we buy by the box. And so the whole system was great. The only thing that was missing was how long do the tethers have to be? Well, Proctor, you get, nobody had any money back then. You know, Proctor was no exception. And the regatta was basically broke. Everybody volunteered and their time. They begged, borrowed, and stole the, the Clorox bottles and the bricks. They were cheap. And so Proctor had some friends at the Manchester Yacht Club. So he borrowed a depth sounder, and he drove it down the course, and he made this map which actually, this has been reduced, so there's no way you can see this more you're seated. But this is one half of the course, and this is the other. And he knew how far away the buoys had to be from one another. 20 meters, I believe, and 30 meters. Uh, 30, 20 meters on the turns and 30 meters on the straightaways. And he then knew how far away he had to sound the course. So every little dot on this map, which represents a buoy, all 350 of them, there's a little number next to it that tells you how deep the water was in, the, in 2004. It's time we did it again. Um, and then you had solved the final riddle, which was how long do the tethers have to be? You cut the tethers, you then mark the buoys with a tether, with the length of the tether um, number on the bottom of the buoy, and then you tabulated how many buoys of different lengths and different colors you had to have in the two boats that set the course, boat A and boat B. Boat A is the bottom half from weeks to the start, boat B is from weeks to the finish. And you had all these tubs laid out and all these crates of anchors, you deploy the two boats, and um, Chris Richards drives one, Tim Wood drives the other, they've been doing this for years and they set an excellent line. Now I suppose you're wondering, how do we, like, how do you know how far away, how far apart to put the buoys? No problem, Mr. Proctor had a solution for that. In his little workshop, he fabricated this little paddle with the uh, line, which is very carefully measured, that had two clips, one at the very end, which was 30 meters, and then the other one would be 22 meters. And he'd tie a little bobbin on each of these, clip it on, and this he would pay out behind the launch until he got to the very end. And as the launch went by, he would know exactly when to drop the next buoy because you waited until the bobber passed the buoy you had previously set. And with that mystery solved, he now could set the entire course, takes two crews a little over two hours on a good day to drop in the entire course. And to take it up uh, requires a little, about the same time. But that's not all that you have to do. Because there's some other buoys that also uh, have to be set. In addition to the course buoys, and of course there's now three different colors of those. They have the orange ones that separate the upstream and downstream. The green ones mark the, the starboard most uh, limits of the, of the race course. And we also have some white ones to assist us with the downstream traffic on the Elliott Bridge turn, among other places. But then there's these other buoys. This is a, oh, an early mock-up of one of these other buoys. This would be the starting line tetrahedron. We had two starting line tets, and you'll see some of these in the photographs of the early regattas. You can see them there, their characteristic shape. Um, he designed all these things, figured out how wide to make these, and the real genius of it, I wish I had one, there's this, I think we use um, three of the original five we still use. We've replaced some of them with inflatables. But he made this uh, tetrahedron, so these would have uh, triangular uh, parcels of this fabric here, which is yellow uh, fabric, which he silk screened all the numbers. He silk screened the S's, he silk screened the numbers for start, one mile and two mile mark, and F for finish line. And his loving wife um, 
Slim Proctor, who is actually an artist, and she's having an art show. She's in her 90s, and she's having an, art, an oil paintings art show in Manchester this Saturday. It's the grand opening. Uh, her kids thought it would be a nice idea if she sh had this art show while she was still living. So, sure enough, it's coming on this weekend. She's talented in her own right. And she, because like I said, nobody had any money, they got all this fabric, and she sewed the fabric for these tetrahedrons on her sewing machine. And then he went down to a shop and he figured out how to put this together. What it is, is I, it's hard to show you because I got to hold this microphone in one hand, but if you could just hold that, Mel. Um, there would be a plastic tube here which would push down on these elastic cords and that would push up and hold the tetrahedron inflated, so to speak. And then you anchored this uh, down below. And then that was a, a stroke of brilliance because when the regatta was over, you simply took out the tube and the tetrahedron would fold flat and you could stow it uh, with only this minimum space uh, uh, necessary to, stay, to store it, which was very critical given the limited amount of space they had in the boathouse. So we replaced some of those with uh, inflatable ones, and they seem to work pretty well. Um, I just, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I missed uh, about the general uh, course. Um, I think that pretty well covers it. It was a, I think, I swear to God, the guy was a genius. I mean, he thought of virtually everything. Distance between the buoys, visual profile, um, accommodation with the elastic tethers, because back then, the MDC, uh, probably a different organization now, but they controlled the height of the river uh, on regatta weekend. And depending on the amount of upstream rainfall, they could pump or not pump, as the case may be. And over regatta race weekend, the, the height of the water could change by as much as 12 inches. Um, and so, the elastic tether was the secret to keeping the buoys. This, uh, thanks, Matt. This is a a homemade short course uh, ring buoy. Um, these mark the entrance to the start. There was three of them, so that the starter could gauge the speed of the boat as they approached the start line and 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 let them know to you know, full pressure, half pressure, whatever the case may be. And this thing he fabricated himself. I mean, there's your two and a half inch schedule forty. But this one's got a hook on the bottom, he poured the concrete in it, and then he cobbed up this thing on here with a little spring clip so he could get the, the bamboo flag out, which I'm sure was probably some uh, ski race flag that he salvaged and put on there. But that's, that's the pegs in here to wind the tether on. I mean, in his perfect lettering on the base, it says short course. I mean, his product, his work product was impeccable. Um, everything he did, his craftsmanship was superb. Here's some other flags that I salvaged from some of the other early ring buoys. Um, everything grommeted together. It's just superb workmanship. I can't believe it. And we are using a lot of the same things today. A couple of little tweaks. We've changed a couple of anchor weights. Uh, but essentially, it's the original course intact. Uh, and we're getting it so we keep refining it a little every year. That's essentially all I can think of to tell you. Anyone have any questions about the course? It's, Roughly 350 buoys, same number of anchors. We lose a few each year, but we're uh, always happy to do this. This makes me so happy to do this. I love this thing. And I hope you do too. Are we going to get the timing, the, uh, the, the new way to do the manual backup timing? The new way to do the manual yeah, backup timing? Yeah, the wooden things that oh, all yeah. went off well, the stopwatches at the same time? Yeah, that's, that's another story for another day. But the course committee does deploy the sight line sticks at the finish line, which were handmade. Um, so it's just a line of string, and then you have a perfectly plumbed sight on the opposite side. We also have those for the other uh, split timing locations. And we've also fixed the one for the starting line. Every year we keep tweaking it, make it a little bit better. Now, that's our goal, is just to make it a little better every year. So for those of you who are racing, good luck. And um, we are going to try to set as good a course as we always do. Thank you. Thank you.